Hello everyone. I hope all of you are doing well. You're safe and healthy and just making good decisions out there. I know you've missed the class. I've missed you. Ha ha ha. But I've missed you a lot and being here. I don't like being not being able to be in the room. But we're, I'm going to try something new and different. I'm going to do the notes in the class, a lot of it through video. So I'm going to post these. Uh, you're to take notes. I'll be sending you, you know, uh, in the future, the fill in the blank notes, but all of chapter one for economics on basic econ concepts is done through notes. So you're going to need a blank piece of paper or a few to take notes or a line piece of paper to take notes so that we can continue learning. So you do not have to come to school in June. So with that being said, let's uh, start uh, by talking about the assignment I gave you last week. You were supposed to do the city budget simulation and you were to try to decide what are you going to do with the problem of being short $300,000. So when I asked you the homework question, what was the main economic problem? Most of you said budgeting or a lack of money or something like that. But is it really money? Is that really the basic economic problem that we face? Couldn't we just print more money? Or let's just say, what if every one of you had a part-time job and you made $10,000? If all of a sudden I snap my fingers and now you each made $20,000, would that solve all of the problems that we face? And we would say no, because we have some things, not money, that are causing this issue. So what is this basic economic problem? It comes down to one word. This whole class is about one word. And that word is scarcity. Scarcity. Things are scarce. What does that mean, though? What does it mean? If I ever ask you, you know, what's the basic economic problem, you could just put that word down. Scarcity. Things, we don't have enough. What does that mean, though? What does it mean we don't have enough? Well, if you pick somebody you know and just said, hey, uh, let's go to Taco Bell today, or when this is over, let's go to Taco Bell and your friend walks up to the counter and says, I'd like to order five gorditas, three chalupas, six Mexican pizzas, 10 bags of those little cinnamon twists, and a gallon of Pepsi. And they eat all of it and drink all of it. Would that person say, wow, that was really good. I never have to eat again. No, they wouldn't. Because the things that we face, the scarcity problem, is ongoing because we have things that we always want to have more of, more of, okay? No matter what, I mean, clothes. Uh, if you buy a car today, you know, sometime in the future, you're gonna want another one. So scarcity is the problem, and its definition is just four simple words. They are, we have unlimited wants. You want more food, you want more clothes, you want another car, but we have limited resources. So that's why it's not money, it's, it's those other things that we are short of, resources. What does it mean though when we use the word resource? Uh, what are we talking about? What resources could you list right now that we're short of? Besides toilet paper, and I think most of the pasta in the store, I've never, I haven't seen any pasta, all the eggs are gone. But besides that, when we think about the country as a whole, what are the resources we don't have? Because our wants keep going all the way until we die. Uh, that's the only time your wants stop. But we always have this limited amount of resources. What are those resources? Well, economists are going to use different terms in this class that you may not you know, have heard of before or may have kind of an alternate meaning. The first one is this. These resources they're talking about are called 
Number two, the factors of production. It's everything that goes into producing everything we have. The scarcity problem we talked about in the first one is not just faced by you and I, but it's also faced by businesses. And as we can see, it's also faced by governments too. We have scarce resources. We don't have enough for everyone to get everything that they want. That's just a, a fact of life. But economists use the term factors of production to describe these resources. Um, and you could also call it, you know, uh, they, they use the term FOP, or they also call it economic resources. Oh, great, the lights are going out. So <laughs> sorry about that, because I'm not moving around enough, maybe. Economic resources. Now, what would we use to describe that? Well, if I asked you to tell me about this, this is where you know, I hold all those pens usually, what goes into producing this item here? What can you list? Well, the easiest thing to see is what? Yeah, it's probably the, the block of wood. And what do we call wood? And like uh, gold and minerals and animals and all those things, what do we usually call those? Usually we call those natural resources. Well, economists, this is the first time I'm going to tell you, they use a different term for that. All those things they call land. They call all those, and we'll put natural resources in parentheses here just to remember that. Economists call natural resources land, gifts of nature, those things that we see that just occur naturally. What else are you going to need to produce this? Besides, you know, some trees. You're going to need some trees. What else are you going to need? Well, hopefully you've guessed you're going to need some people who take the trees and turn it into that, and we call that labor. Labor. Okay, the people that cut it down, that drive it to the factory, the people that work at the factory, all those things, we're going to need some labor. Now, in land, we said it was natural resources. What is labor? What are we going to use as the alternate term for labor? Let's see if you can come up with it. Most large corporations have this department within their corporation that deals with the people that work there. Hopefully you guessed that it is human resources. Most corporations have a human resources department that deals with all the people that work there. So, so far you have the trees, you have the people. What else are you going to need? Well, I don't believe that these grow naturally. I don't think they're seeds we throw in the ground and this pops up. So you're going to need what? You're probably going to need some tools, some equipment, a factory or something to turn the tree into this. Now, this is one of those other terms that, you know, the economists use that we're not familiar with. We're usually familiar with a different definition. This is the word capital. And it's the tools, equipment, and factories used in production. You're going to have to cut down the tree with a saw or something. You're going to have to have a truck that, you know, a forklift that picks up the trees, puts them on the truck, the truck that drives them there. Then you're going to have to have the factory that turns that tree into blocks of wood. Now, you have land, labor, and capital. The last thing that we need, letter D, is actually the first thing that we really need. The first thing that we need before the other ones. And usually... It's the person with the idea, hey, I'd like to 
turn some trees into these and sell these. So what is the person with the idea called? That person is the entrepreneur. And usually we put down that it's more, it's a person who's a risk taker in search of profit. They're in search of profit. Most of us are not entrepreneurs. We're gonna work for somebody else and earn wages, you know, salary. But an entrepreneur is looking for that profit where it's gonna cost me this much, hopefully I can sell it for this much and then make a profit on that. So those are the four factors of production you need to produce everything that we have. So once you have this kind of stuff or access to it, because sometimes an entrepreneur might be a person with an idea, but they actually don't own the land, you know, the natural resource, they don't own the capital, they'd have to hire people. So sometimes entrepreneurs have to pay for the use of these four things or the other three things. So there's a word that refers to that payment. So if an entrepreneur needs to use somebody else's natural resources, they would have to pay what's called rent for that. If you're going to have to use somebody else's you know, labor, you're going to have to pay wages. And if you're going to have to use somebody else's tools, equipment, and factory, their capitals, the payment for that is called interest. And we already know the payment for the entrepreneur is the word profit. So now that you have those, you know, those the four things are present. So we know that uh, production can take place. There are actually three basic questions we must ask. Three basic questions. Before we get going, we have to ask and answer these three questions. What can you think, what would you think would be the first question? If we have, you know, access to some land, some natural reason, we have access to some people, some workers we could hire, we have access to tools, equipment, and factory, maybe you're the entrepreneur. What's the first question you must ask and answer? Hopefully, I don't even know what you're thinking. You can just sit there and watch the video and not think at all, right? Well, I wish it was says in class, so I'd have to maybe pick on you or have people raise their hands. But the first question you must ask, let's say you had some trees. Let's say you had some trees and you had a bunch of people out there you could hire and you have access to tools, equipment, and factories. The first question you're going to have to ask is what to produce? What am I going to make with those trees that I have in this, that labor tool? Am I going to make this block? Am I going to make the podium that I have? Uh, the, you know, the old chair that I have? Or are you going to make two by fours for construction? You have to decide because you can't, because of scarcity, you can't make everything for everyone. So you're going to have to decide what to make. Let's say... <clears throat> You decide to make toothpicks with the trees. Now your lifelong goal is to be a toothpick manufacturer. You know, somebody does that and actually makes money. So you decide, I'm gonna take those trees, I'm gonna to produce toothpicks. What's the next question you have to ask and answer? It would be how to produce. How to produce those toothpicks. There are different ways to do that. You could hire a bunch of people to go into the forest, cut down trees. You've hired people who are going to run the backhoe to pick up the logs, put them on the truck. You've hired truck drivers. They're going to drive it to the factory. At the factory, workers put the trees through a machine. It cuts wood into long boards. And then there's another machine they put the boards through. And out pops these toothpicks at the end. That's one way. The other way you could do it is you could show up at Wood Creek and say, I'd like to hire everybody who wants to, 20 bucks an hour, to make toothpicks. Maybe you have people sign up and you go, okay, here's a tree, here's a knife, whittle. 
That would be a really dumb way to do it in the United States with technology, but a lot of places around the world, they st still do things by hand, but you could do it by hand or you could do it by machine. So you have to decide how are you going to produce those things? What's the last one? The last question, because of scarcity and we can't produce everything for everyone, the last question is for whom to produce? For whom? Am I going to produce these toothpicks for sale at Rayleigh's for consumers? Or am I going to produce these toothpicks to supply to uh, restaurants who give them out for free to pick that stuff out of your teeth, okay? So you have to decide for whom. If you're doing two by fours, are you going to produce two by fours for single family home construction or for construction of office complexes? Or are you going to produce them for Lowe's and Home Depot who are then going to resell them? So you have to decide those three basic questions before you actually produce something. Now, after all that discussion, then what is economics? If you were to look up a definition, like in a college uh, handbook, it lists all their classes and it says, here's economics. What is economics? If you look at all the things that we wrote, so far, can you quickly come up with what is economics? Give it a try, and I don't know if you're going to, but we would in class, give it a try. Try to look at what we wrote, what is economics? I'm gonna write it here, what is economics? I could help you out too, I could put, it would start like this, the study of, because we're going to study something, you know, most things you take in college, and you know, economics is a social, social science, it's going to be the study of what? Well, if you take the first thing we wrote, the definition of scarcity, and just take each of those two word phrases in the definition, and kind of expand on those, then you would get kind of the definition. The study of human efforts to satisfy what appear to be, now here's where we take that first part, kind of unlimited so we're, going to, we're talking here about the unlimited wants, but what else do your wants in your personal life, what do they do? Besides there being unlimited, you always, always want more, more, more. You have to eat, you have to you know, have more clothes. Hopefully you're not wearing the same clothes 30 years from now that you're wearing today. But those are unlimited, but also your wants do something else with each other. They actually compete with each other. They appear to be unlimited and competing unlimited and competing wants your wants because you want this and this and this and you want to do this and buy this and do this you can't do it all at the same time so you actually have to make decisions so that's the first part economics is a study of human efforts to satisfy what appear to be unlimited and competing wants how are you gonna do it through the careful use of relatively scarce resources. So you're going to try to fulfill these unlimited and competing wants and try to be very careful about using these resources that are scarce because you can't fulfill all of them at the same time. So you're gonna to have to make some decisions and be careful and realize businesses have to do the same thing. Governments have to do the same thing because the resources are scarce. We should be very careful in the decisions we make and how to use them, trying to satisfy the most people we can probably, but we can't, we can't make everybody happy. We can't supply everything for everyone. So that is 
kind of what economics is all about. Now, what I'd like you to do right now on, this, on your piece of paper, or just off on the side, on the margin somewhere, if I handed you a $100 bill, I would like you to write down just three things you'd buy with that $100 bill. Each of the things that you're buying, one, two, and three, each of those things would be $100. So let's say clothes, you put that down first, you'd buy $100 worth of clothes. So real quickly, just write down three things that you would buy. I'm only gonna give you a little bit of time. It shouldn't, it's not rocket science, it's not a big deal. What three things would you buy if I handed you a $100 bill? Now, economists call that something because like, you only have a $100 bill. And let's say you listed yours as like clothes, food, and gas. $100 worth of clothes or $100 worth of food or $100 worth of gas. Well, economists call those your trade-offs. Those are your alternative choices. And they're alternative choices in, actually, alternative choices in the use of time. Because sometimes you would like to go here and do this or do that, but you can't do them both. So you have to make a choice. Use of time, money, or resources. Those are your trade-offs. I can do this or this or this. Those are your trade-offs. Now, if I was to ask you to take those three things that you listed and look at your list and now put them in what you would consider priority order, because you just brainstormed really quick. Now, if you had to choose with that $100, which one would you buy first? Which one would you buy second? And which one would you purchase third? So real quickly look at that, rearrange those. Now, whether your order changed or not, if you spent the $100 on that first thing on your list, what does that cost you in consideration of your choice? What does that really cost you? Well, economists, when you make that choice, when you buy the first thing, on your list, economists would say that is illustrating and talking about opportunity cost. <clears throat> opportunity cost. And I've always thought about it this way. When you choose that first thing on your list, what is the cost of that choice? Well, the cost of that choice of the first thing is you lose the opportunity to get the next thing on your list because you have a limited amount of resources and this way it's money, but you choose number one, you can't do number two, you can't do number three. That is your opportunity cost. So if you put, were to put that down, it says it would be the next best alternative use of time, money, or resources. So when you choose one, the cost of that choice is you lose the opportunity to do the next thing on your list. Now, we're going to take those two things and kind of talk about them now. In economics, uh, economists use lots of diagrams and charts to illustrate what's going on. So this is our first one we're going to use and we're going to illustrate what we just talked about. This is called the production possibility Curve, or PPC, the Production Possibility Curve. And if you look at those words, you'll understand how much production is possible. That's what you're talking about. And in this country, in this business, whatever we're talking about, they only produce two things. So this is what you're going to draw. 
I'll move it up. You're going to draw this. Okay, uh, it's really tough. You can do that. And then you're going to draw your curve. You're just going to start up at the top and just draw the curve down to the X like that. So there it is. Now, let's talk about what is this doing, okay? So, individuals, businesses, government, they all are going to be looking at the production possibility curve. <clears throat> so, the classic example is <laughs> called, uh, this country only makes two things, guns and butter. So, the only two things that they actually produce are guns and butter. So when we look at this and we go up here and you put a point right there and let's say that's point A, right there, point A. How would you describe production if this country is producing at point A? Remember, there's no numbers on here, so you, know, you have to be a little bit more general. We can't use numbers. So the way you would describe this, this country is producing all guns and no butter. Does that make sense? All guns, right here, they're producing all guns, but no butter. All of you know that this point is zero and this point right here is zero. So all guns, no butter. Now, how would you describe if we go down here to point B, down here, how would you describe that? Of course, you'd say this country is producing all butter and no guns. Can this country produce at point C? Yeah, you can. And let's say we had started at A. We just started at point A, the country is producing here, and now the country moved over to this production point. How would you describe that change? You would say, if they went from A to C, and you can look at it like this. Now you can draw on little dotted lines and say, oh, look it, they're producing less guns, but more butter. Because they had produced here at zero butter, now they're producing here that amount of butter. They used to produce at point A for guns, but now they're here. So it's less guns, more butter. Can they produce at point D? Yeah, they can produce there also. It's just a different combination. So this curve right here, you could actually put dot, 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 all these different production possibility points. They could produce at any one of these possible production points. So what is this really illustrating for us? Two things. And I'll just put this paper down uh, here, I guess. Two things that this is illustrating for us. The first thing is, <clears throat> what does this curve represent? What is that curve representing? It's representing the various combinations of a product that can be produced. So that curve is showing us all the various combinations of a product that can be produced at a particular point. So at you know, one particular point in time, they're producing here at C. They could be producing at D. So it's all the various combinations. Now, there is another question for you. Can this country produce at point E? No, because this shows all the various combinations of production that can be produced, and we're going to put a little if here, 
if, sorry about the writing, if all resources are used to the maximum. So the various combinations of, of product that can be produced if the country, the government, the individual is using all of their resources to the maximum. All the resources we would say are fully employed. There's nothing idle. There's nothing sitting. We're using all the land, all the labor, all the capital, entrepreneurship. We're using it all to the maximum. Can this person, this country, this individual produce at point F? Yes, they could, but how would you describe that? Well, if they're producing at point F, which is way inside the curve, it means they're not using all of their resources to the maximum. That would be point F. Not all resources are being used to the maximum. Okay? Got that down? Not all resources are being used to the maximum. Now, what can we say overall? What does this production possibility curve, what is it representing? What concept, what economic concept, and it's a concept we've just been talking about, what does it illustrate? I'll put it here, kind of the PPC, so the production possibility curve illustrates the concept of anybody get guess opportunity cost it represents opportunity cost. Why? Well, if we produce, if we go back, I'll put it back up again. If you produce at point C, the cost of that choice, right? You're losing the opportunity to, to produce at point B or point B or any place else in here. If you choose to produce here, the cost of that is losing the opportunity to produce anywhere else on the diagram. Okay? Everybody got that? I'll put it up there. The PPC illustrates the concept of opportunity cost. I guess it would be easy You can go back if you miss something and re-watch the video. That would be the highlight of your day probably, right? Yeah, I don't know what else you're doing at home, playing games, hanging out on your computer or your phone a lot. Hopefully you're doing other things while you're there. Now, I usually have the class at this point, we just take five or so minutes and try to brainstorm all the things that you've purchased in the last week as a, as a class. And we just put it up on the board, just brainstorm, you know, I went to Taco Bell, I went to the movies, got my haircut, bought some food, and you know, bought, and all these different things that students have bought. And then once we've listed them on the board, I ask all the students to say, or come up with, all those things on the board, what two categories would they fall into? And all of the students usually always come up with, they come into these two categories. They are, um, let's see, which way do I want to put it? Um, I guess needs and wants. I'm going to have to switch pens. This pen is really not doing so well. I brought some extra needs and wants. So if you go back to, you know, what's a need? Most of you probably did this when you're in elementary school. A need is something that's basic for survival. And usually there's uh, only five. It's usually air, water, food, clothing, and shelter. Usually those are the five where you have to have those to survive. So those are needs. Then what is a want? Most of us would have said, 
uh, pretty much everything else. Well, here's one of those things where the economists throw a little monkey wrench in there because, and I'm going to tell you this definition that's in the book, I don't really care for because I don't think personally it fits every situation. But economists say, ready, a want is a way of expressing a need. It's a way of expressing a need. Now, I'm not really sure that that is a great definition. Here, let me explain what they mean. In the book, it says this. My need is food. My want is pizza. So that's the way they would say it, it would work. Well, on some of the things... You know, I don't know if the things we listed on the board, gum, if you bought some gum, what need is that expressing? You know, that doesn't really work. Or if you bought oil for your car, that, you know, driving isn't a need. Sorry to tell you, it's not really a need. We could get along without it. But, you know, I don't think that fits. But that's what they tell you. Okay? Now, if you, once we got that, needs and wants, that's simple. Then I have students look at the list on the board and I ask them, okay, now try to put all those things that we came up with that you bought in the last week, what other two categories could they go into? And students come up with different ones and it's actually kind of hard. And then after a while, I'll go off the, on the board and like uh, circle the things that are in one category and then everything else would be in that other category and it sort of helps. Sometimes they'll come up with it. But if you think about it, all those things that we buy fall into these two categories also. Besides needs and wants, they fall into the two categories of goods and services. Goods and services. So let's just talk about the first one, letter A. What's a good? And usually it's a tangible. means you can touch it. A tangible commodity, which is a fancy word, you know, for product. It's tangible. You can touch it. And there are different types of goods economists talk about. Uh, the first one is a consumer good. And it's real simple. The final use is by the consumer. So most of the things you go into the store, if you went to Best Buy, if you went to Rayleigh's or Bella or Savemar, those things are consumer goods. They're made for you and I. Then there are things that are called capital goods. And if you think about the word capital that we already described, tools, equipment, and factory used in production, what would be a capital good? It's a good used to produce other, and I'm going to do it this way, G and S. It's a good that's used to produce other goods and services. So if uh, the Chevy dealer down at the auto mall, if they buy a wrench, that's not for consumer, that's for them to use in the fixing of, their car, of the car. So that's not for consumer. So those are capital goods. Then you have something called a durable good. And like the word, you know, hopefully you understand durable, it, the definition is lasts longer than three years. That's a durable good. Uh, food and clothing, all that. Uh, well, you're talking about a lot of times appliances, uh, gardening equipment, stereos, furniture, you know, your refrigerator at home, uh, stoves. And a lot of times, I mean, the government actually keeps track of how many of those are manufactured and sold, durable goods, because many times some of those things are fairly expensive. Uh, durable good. Um, let's say a refrigerator. If you have a refrigerator at home right now and it's like 10 years old, but it still works, 
would you run out and buy a new one? Well, maybe not today with the economy and things the way they're going. You want to hold on to your money if your refrigerator's you know, working fine. It's just not the newest model. You'll probably just go, yeah, I'll just hold on to it. If the economy's going well, you might go out and buy a new one and just upgrade. Does, does that make sense that why the government keeps track of durable goods? If they say the orders for durable goods were up last month, it means people are out spending money. And they're usually fairly confident about the economy, about their job. So durable goods last longer than three years. And hopefully for number four, I don't have to put a definition, but you have the things that are called non-durable goods. And those are the things that you know last less than three years. So fairly simple. So those are the different types of goods. And then B is services. A service, like getting your hair cut. Uh, actually, going to the movies is a service, right? Unless you steal the chair or something like that. But, you know, go get a haircut. Hopefully they don't give you your hair in a bag. Services, work performed for others. That is, those are the services. Somebody else is doing work. So if you go to a restaurant, it's kind of almost like both. You get a good, you get the food, but you also get the service. They're providing a service, cooking and delivering it for you. So those are goods and services. Now let's talk about consumers. If I was to ask you to give me a definition of a consumer based on what we have already talked about, what would you come up with? What, what would be a consumer? It's weird sitting here waiting. You know, it's not like class. So I don't know if you're sitting there you know, drinking a soda, eating ice cream, whatever you're doing. A definition of a consumer, ready? Someone who uses what? What are they going to use that we've already talked about? They're going to use goods and services to satisfy what? Needs and wants. So somebody who's going to use the goods and services to satisfy their needs and wants. That's what a consumer is. Now, consumption, in many instances, most of us think that to consume means to eat, but in economics, consumption is the process of, and I'm just going to draw an arrow, because it's the process of using goods and services to satisfy your needs and wants. That's the process, okay? And then the last one, there's this thing they you ever run into anybody you think, you know, that buys things, maybe they do like them, but they buy them so that people see them, like wearing that kind of brand of clothes or driving that kind of car. It's the word that means to be seen. This is a kind of consumer who wants to be seen, you know, smelling like this, driving that, wearing that, living here. And it's a big word, it's called conspicuous. I'll make sure I spell it right. I don't know, and I don't get to erase like on the whiteboard. Conspicuous, conspicuous consumption. Use of G and S to impress others so conspicuous consumption the use of goods and services to impress others hopefully you're not impressed by what other people drive and everything like that because that's kind of vain but you know some people are like that they try to impress other people so we're almost done here a couple more things to do this idea of value utility 
and wealth. What are those things? What is, well, what's value? What things are valuable? Okay. And so if we just talk about letter A, we just talk about a uh, value. There is something called a paradox of value. The paradox of value. So I guess you'd have to figure out, you know, what is a paradox? There's a couple of surgeons at the hospital. Some of you will get that later. A paradox. A lot of times uh, it's an, the idea that you would think something would be this way, but it's actually the opposite. It's a paradox. And what this means is, why are some things that are essential to life, essential, you have to have them, why are they not very valuable? Yet some things that aren't essential to life at all are very valuable. That's kind of a paradox. You would think that something that's essential to life, you have to have, would be very valuable. But in some instances, it's not. This is called, ready? The water diamond. Paradox. The water diamond paradox. If you think about it, water, and it's essential to life. You can only go a few days without water, but it's not very valuable. You can turn on your tap and it comes out, and, you know, for a gallon, it's like a penny at the most. So water, it's essential to life, but it's not very valuable. And even though I've had some females disagree with me, diamonds are not essential to life. But they're very, very valuable. Ladies and gentlemen, what explains that paradox? Why is water, which is essential to life, not very valuable, yet diamonds, which aren't essential to life, why are they very, very valuable? Anybody come up with it? Because it's based on what we've already talked about. It's the idea of scarcity. Scarcity is the answer to this paradox. Water is not very scarce. Now, sometimes if you do to go through a drought, water can become more valuable, but water falls from the sky. It's not very valuable, even though we need to have it. Diamonds are more scarce. So that makes them a little bit, that makes them actually more valuable. You know, if diamonds fell from the sky, then they wouldn't be very valuable and it would hurt. But, you know, so that's the water diamond paradox. But if you were to pick two people, uh, just, I don't know, I was going to, I usually do this by picking people in the class and saying, hey, if this uh, female, maybe she really, really, really likes diamonds. Her mantra is when she gets engaged, the bigger, the better. That's what she wants. Whereas another female would say that she, she doesn't care. She goes, when, she, when I get engaged, another guy can make a ring out of a gum wrapper. I don't really care. Now, scarcity doesn't answer that question. Why is it so important to the one person, diamonds, and not to the other? They're still scarce. So what answers that question in that situation? Yes, Mr. Johnson, it would be the next word that we were going to talk about. It is the concept of utility the capacity to be useful to someone so for that one person diamonds were very very useful they really want they really liked them but the other person had no use you can use that remember because utility changes from person to person. Somebody might think this is really valuable or really important, and another person might think the same thing is not. 
sort of like this class, right? That economics is really important. Uh, and other people think it's not. So that's utility, how useful it is to someone uh, in a particular situation. Now, that's the word, and this is going to be hard. I was going to say, uh, this is for your economics project, but it's not. You're not doing it anymore because utility was one of those concepts that, that you were supposed to maybe use to connect the class to your volunteering. But since you don't have to volunteer, I guess that doesn't apply. But that's utility. Like if you go to uh, the Salvation Army or let's say go to Goodwill. That has utility. People come in and buy things that are less expensive who are maybe lower income. If you go to an animal shelter, that has uh, utility for those animals and for the community by providing a place where the animals can be brought, spayed and neutered so we don't have a problem. So that's the word utility. The last word is wealth. What is wealth? What do we consider as wealth? And wealth is actually a combination of things. It's the sum of those economic products that are, and then there's four concepts. So wealth, the sum of those economic products that are what? What concepts have we already talked about that would actually kind of describe what wealth is? Well, the first one you would know is something has to be scarce. If I'm talking to you and you say I'm really wealthy and I say why and you said because I have lots of rocks in my backyard, well, that's not really wealth because those aren't scarce, okay? So something has to be, for to be considered wealth, it has to be scarce. It actually has to be tangible. It has to be kind of be able to touch. If I ask you how come you're wealthy and you say because you have a lot of great ideas, well, that's not really wealth. You have to turn those ideas into something tangible. Then you actually have to have, wealth is also the word useful. You have to have something, you have something that's totally useless and that's not considered wealth. And then the last thing is it, has to be transferable. It has to be transferable. It has to be able to be transferred from one person to another. That would be wealth. So wealth is those things that are scarce, tangible, useful, and transferable. Um, the next concept is the idea of productivity. Sorry about all the writing, but you know the next chapters will be I'll try to work it out, the fill in the blank, so you can do that. Um, I'll have to figure out if I can send it to you, the fill in the blank, and like you can print it, or if I send you with the fill in the, it'd be really hard to do the little boxes, but maybe I could do that where you could just fill it out, you know, make a little corner with me talking. You know, that's all you need is a little corner of me. Okay, talking, and then you could fill those out. What is productivity then? What is, what is that talking about? Productivity. When... The FOP, when the factors of production are present. So when you have entrepreneur, you have land, labor, and capital. When the factors of production are present, productivity can take place. So if you have the factors of production there, then you can actually produce things. They can take place. Okay. The second thing is um, efficient use of FOP. Whoops, that's FOD, sorry. FOP is productivity. The efficient use, the efficient use of FOP is not showing up very well. I'm going to get a better pen. The efficient use, like, is it very fair to compare the United States, you know, in our production to a really small country, let's say like uh, Honduras, 
can we say, oh, we produce way more than Honduras. Well, we have a bigger country and everything, more resources, more people. What you would actually compare is you take how much Honduras actually produces a country, divide that number by how many workers they have, and you would get a productivity number. Then you would take how much we produce, which is called GDP, how much we produce in our country, divided by the number of workers, and you get a product productivity number. You can compare those numbers. And that's the way you can see maybe they're more efficient. Just because they produce less than we do doesn't mean they aren't more efficient than we are. The last word is specialization. Specialization. <clears throat> what we're saying is productive resources should do what they're best suited for. So resources, I'll try to abbreviate it. Resources do what they do best. So that would be like, you want to have a carpenter build your house. You don't want me, a teacher, trying to build your house. You don't want me trying to cook for you because I don't know how to cook. So you want the resource that's best, do what it's best, and that's specialization. Henry Ford kind of came up with this. Remember the production line? Before that, they used to you know, have all the car parts and a bunch of people put the car together. Well, then they specialized and they did one particular thing on the assembly line as the car went by, became more efficient, more specialized, and were able to produce the car more efficiently and faster and therefore cheaper. Okay. Now, that's pretty much it, except for one last diagram we'll do. And we'll be finished. Hopefully, my video doesn't run out by that time, but... We'll do one more thing, and this is another diagram, and this is called the circular flow chart. Um, I, I might, we just are just going to draw it because it's very hard to try to send this or for me to create this for you. And you're just going to do this, a box. A box here, a box here, and a box over here. That's all you're going to do. And I'm going to switch pens again. Okay, everybody got that? Just four boxes, circular flow. And you're going to draw an arrow from the bottom of this, kind of the right side here. Gonna, oh, that pen sucks big time. So, good thing this is at the end. We're going to draw an arrow like that. And then an arrow continuing like that. And then another arrow like that. That's not a very good arrow. And another arrow like that. So you have like an inside circle of arrows. Then on the outside, we can start here. We're going to go the opposite way. Draw an arrow like that. Arrow like that. An arrow like that and an arrow like that so this is circular flow okay it's talking about how things are interconnected in our economy actually in the world how we're interconnected so the the box at the top you just put the word individuals So all that is doing is that's representing you and I, we as individuals, okay? Now the thing, the key thing about our economy and what we've been talking about today is one thing that sets us apart from socialism, communism is we as individuals, we own the factors of production. We own the land, natural resources. We own the labor, our own you know, work. We own the, uh, the capital, tools, equipment, and factories, and we're the entrepreneurs. In communism, the government owns everything. In socialism, you have a combination. But in our system, we own the factors of production. What do we do with those, the land, labor? Do we want to hold on to those? Do we want to hold on to the factors of production? I want to just hold on to my labor, like right now, and sit at home in my room. No, you don't want to hold on to that. You want to go to work right and make some money so 
on this first arrow, what we're going to put is sell scarce resources. We want to sell those resources. We want them to put them to work in order to earn money, okay? And so this first box over here is called the factor. Remember, the, this is the factor market, you know, factors of production. This is where the land, the labor, the capital, and the entrepreneurship it's where they're going to be exchanged we don't want to hold on to them we want to put them to use okay so we're gonna sell the scarce resources this box down here this is businesses so this is kind of showing what's the interaction between us as individuals and businesses we're going to sell the scarce resources. The businesses, they're going to buy the scarce resources. Sorry, that's scribbled. Buy the scarce resources. The businesses, they want natural resources. They want our labor. They want the tools, equipment, and factories. So they're going to buy. We're going to sell. What do the businesses want those for? Why do they want the land, the labor, the capital? What are they going to do with those? Well, as we were talking about earlier with, you know, the toothpicks or that pen holder that I have, they're going to do what? They're going to provide G and S. They're going to provide goods and services. They're going to take the land, labor, capital, entrepreneur, they're going to turn them into goods and services. Okay? They turn those into things that are goods and things that are services. So over here, you have something called the product market. And product is sometimes a generic word for goods and services. So we sell the resources, the businesses buy, they turn them into goods and services, and then what happens? We buy the goods and services. We want those things that they produce. We can't produce our own televisions, our own cars, our own clothes. So we want to sell them to businesses because we want the items, the goods and services that businesses provide. Now on the outside circle, it's going to be the money that is going back in return for each one of these little sections. So when we sell the scarce resources, what do we get? And it's the generic term. We earn Income. Income is kind of the generic term for money that comes in. So we sell those scarce resources and we earn income. Okay. Now, when the businesses buy those scarce resources, what do they pay? They pay for scarce resources, but what do they actually pay? What do they actually pay? And we wrote this down already. If they're going to pay for the use of land, they're going to pay rent. If they're going to pay for the use of somebody's labor, they're going to pay wages. If they're going to pay for tools, equipment, and factories, they're going to pay interest. And if they pay an entrepreneur, they're going to pay the entrepreneur profit. Those things that we wrote down earlier. Okay? So, now, when the businesses provide goods and services, what does the business get back in return? You can't say the word profit because we don't know how much it costs and how much they are selling it for. This is the generic word for money a company business receives. They receive, anybody guess, revenue. Revenue is the generic term for money received by a business. They receive revenue. Okay? So they provide the goods and services. They receive revenue. When we buy the goods and services, what do we spend? Oh, yeah. We spend the income we earned over here. So we spend income. 
So we spend what we already earn. So you can see by this diagram that we are what? What relationship is there between individuals and businesses? Anybody? This shows, this diagram, it shows economic interdependence. We are economically interdependent. The businesses want the land, labor, and capital entrepreneur that we own, and we want the goods and services they produce. This actually is globally too. Other countries produce things that we want, we produce things they want, so we're all economically interdependent on each other. That was a good amount of time, so thanks for paying attention. I'm gonna send you a, an assignment that's on the production possibility curve that you can do and turn in by tomorrow. Hope you're doing well and hopefully this all made sense. Email me or you know, send through Google any questions or email me any questions you have. Thanks, have a great day.